Hey folks, this is Craig. This episode is our chance to say thank you to all those patrons who have contributed to us for the past weeks and months. We also wanted to say that we had a great time in the Difference in Repetition reading group, and it seems that there is a sustained interest in it, so we will most likely do another installment of that very soon. We also have other reading group ideas on the way, so stay tuned for that as well. Also, another big shout out to anybody who has supported us by buying stuff from the Crit Drip merch store. The revenue there goes a long way towards developing the production apparatus of Asset Horizon. If you want to see what's going on in the store now, check out the show notes. Got a link there. In any case, let's take a look at the patron questions and we'll do our best to offer satisfying responses. This is Q&A episode number two, and we are addressing the patron questions that were given to us on Patreon. Hey, if you want to be part of that next time, join our Patreon. On the episode today, we have Adam. Hello. Matt. Hi. And Will. How do you do? Okay, so we're going to get right into the questions today. Uh, The first question that we have comes from Alex. They ask, how do you read? I often have trouble retaining information from the types of text read on the show, and I'm wondering how you folks read, reread, take notes, etc. What do you think, guys? I mean, I I struggle with this one a lot as well. Um, But I found that the best thing I I, I can do is um, I need to sort of put myself in a position where I'm not going to be distracted all the time. Um, Normally that involves just firstly getting away from the computer entirely if I can help it, and I leave my phone there. Um, and then I find if I get like a cold drink, somewhere comfortable to sit. And then I've, I've also found that the use of highlighters, I know, I know some people will sort of cringe about like using highlighters in your, you know, nice new copy or whatever, but highlighters and also those little bookmark tags you can get, the ones, the, the colored ones that stick out the top of the book. I found those are really helpful as well. The highlighters sort of help you draw out certain important passages and then the bookmark tags help you sort of figure out which, which of the important pages of that book which you found when you were reading through so if you want to go back and reread it um, the next time you do it you'll already have those kind of uh uh guidelines you've set for yourself like these are kind of the important bits on the first read and maybe you'll agree with that maybe you'll find something different afterwards but it gives it sort of helps the rereads as well yeah like i think one i've changed on this i used to um simply underline and that was it uh but i found in my work with Acid Horizon, because I'm going to be held like accountable at the level of interpretation, something was going to have to change. So I've started, and it takes a lot of time, but I've started just journaling as I read, um, trying to summarize what in the text is working for me, right? To take that old like letter from a, har- from a harsh critic uh, pointer, what's working for me, and then also just like how I'm feeling about it. Um, so I have a little bit of a system in these notebooks as to as to how how I do that. But I've found that taking notes and then sort of also like keeping an inventory of how I'm feeling as I'm reading, what I'm thinking will allow me to have a reading, right? Because you're responding to all of these, you know, pro- provocations from an author um, in real time. And the amount of that stuff that that I lose uh, while I while I read is remarkable. So being able to just even if it's not even a full sentence, it's just a word or a drawing or something. Just getting it down is really helpful. I know you can't do this necessarily now because of COVID, but I always found that some of my most productive work for research and writing, um, and which involved a lot of like journal article reading, was to print these things out and go to a coffee shop. Uh, just completely away from the rest of the world. Um, it gave me a sense of um, gave me a sense of like activity that wasn't necessarily just burning time in a bedroom or a living room or something like that. Um, the it's remarkable how how much more effective you you are at working when you know that like the coffee shop closes at eleven p.m. It's eight p.m. now, and you really want to get through these articles. So those are the two things um, that that I would recommend. Yeah, it's always quite difficult. I mean, I struggle a lot with, uh, well, it depends. How I read it depends on whether I feel the obligation to take notes or not. So if, if it's for a thing, you know, if, if it's for a class, for a paper, I need to take notes. And I, I really kind of struggle with like doing just handwriting notes because like, my handwriting is just fucking you know, atrocious. So I just tend to get the text in a PDF, especially because it's cheaper. Um, even if I've owned a physical book, I just get a PDF. Like, 
copy out whole se- the sections I find interesting, gradually sort of annotate and commentary on them like line by line. Sometimes only a, f- a few words, an insane amount of a uh, MS Word highlighting, uh, making making parts of the text bigger, bold. Uh, it also kind of gets, especially with some texts as well, I find it gives you a bit more discipline to the text, especially when you have to copy it out, uh, sometimes just typing it out. Particularly if you're reading something like Hegel, which has a you know, a lot of italicization, and sort of going back in throughout the text after you've copied it, and then putting the italicizations back in because they're not originally in the in the, they're not in they're not copied over from the PDF, and then you get to sort of see the points of emphasis. But overall, yeah, it's a very sort of monastic thing, especially due to current pandemic spatial confinements in my flat. I'm just sort of stuck here at my desk all the time. But I, it also, I mean, we had a great point of getting out. Getting outside uh, when possible, you know, even reading in a park somewhere. Uh, libraries, I, you know, I absolutely fucking miss libraries. <laughs> it's the idea of getting outside, especially getting away from Twitter. Although maybe if you, if you, you know, a Twitter social media sort of thing, or maybe you can sort of have a system. You get through like four pages, you reward yourself with five minutes of posting. <laughs> yeah, no, I will say Twitter. Twitter has this like double effect, and like we're we're all like terminally online people now. Um, <laughs> Speak for yourself. Okay, skits Uzi analysis. <laughs> like, <laughs> your, your your meme game can just counters everything that you could say. Oh yeah, no, I'm not on Twitter, but um, <laughs> I I will say Twitter has the double effect of like both being a space where I can ruminate on what I'm feeling like one thing is like I, the way in which i try to use twitter now is different where and obviously everybody's like uh, media social footprint's going to be different the circles that they fall into are going to be different you know and i'm fortunate enough to feel very comfortable uh with the circle that i have on social media just sharing and putting forward these ideas getting responses criticism and so on um so Twitter has that double effect. Like I don't, I don't want to openly bash it because I think in a lot of ways it can incentivize you to return to texts or to think about them. And all of that will return you to the book eventually. So in that sense, I don't want to just openly bash like these, these you know, social media. But it is important to, to, to turn off the monitor every once in a and while. These things are designed to be addictive. Although it does have, as it, yeah, it, says it has its uses. And I've met so many sterner scholars through Twitter <laughs> Which you just wouldn't happen. It wouldn't happen at a conference, especially given the conference and the, you know, it's got a very some very sort of social hierarchy sort of atmosphere to a conference. It's, it's really remarkably it's hierarchical. Yeah, you can just sort of chat shit, and suddenly you meet a scholar who you know wouldn't you wouldn't have had the chance to talk to, and maybe been slightly nervous about it otherwise. Yeah. So it is. It can be a benefit to reading. But overall, I'm quite monastic when it comes to a uh, text. The thing about the thing about the conferences is, is is a great point. Like I, I think if you use these tools the right way, uh, you know they they can be helpful. But like yeah, you do need to you do need to crack open the book and shut off your cell phone. One I guess one last piece of advice is that as you if you particularly if you're reading a book as you're moving through the chapters, one thing I found really helpful is um, when you reach the end of a chapter. <clears throat> um, See if you can, in, in, in a paragraph, maybe two paragraphs, um, explain back what you just read. Um, because then you're not just sort of passively receiving the information from the book. You're also trying to produce it and explain it in, in, a, in a new and condensed way. And if you do that throughout a book, then by the end of it, you'll also have, quite usefully, a, a fairly concise summary of the arguments presented in that text. Um, I, I found that really helpful, especially when you have to get through like a number of chapters. Um, it, it can be really helpful to go back to the summaries you gave yourself um, as a kind of refresher on those earlier ones. I love that advice because one thing that I that I had uh, that that I'd been doing was I I pulled a an assignment um, structure that I had in undergrad and that I've also had you know in other academic uh, environments where you you have to like put forward a critical question or something and i realized just how valuable those were and now i will just sometimes do that um while reading so th- there are all the, all of these strategies but they all take time so i think part of it is to just slow down and calm down and not worry about just rifling through this book you know um people who have 10,000 books on their list of books they've read this year just let them let them do their thing and and you take the time that you need with the text I have a master's degree in education, which I think I mentioned on the previous episode. And, and part of that um, master's program 
involved uh, literacy development, reading strategies, and so forth. And so, and I, I worked with a lot of, I, I work with a population of students for whom reading is often a very difficult task. So there are some go-to strategies that work for, I would say, everybody. And um, here, here's a few of them. First of all, there's research to suggest that reading a physical, tangible copy of a text is better for memory retention than reading on a screen. I looked at that a long time ago. I, I can't recall all of the aspects of the research. There were some questionable things in there, but perhaps one of the reasons that, that might be the case is when people physically interact with a book, they do things like they put their pencil on the page, they underline, there's a, there's a physical contact there. Maybe a long time ago when we were younger, perhaps you remember your mother or father or sister or reading teacher say to you, don't read with your finger. There's research to suggest that reading with your finger, like moving your finger or your pencil underneath the words, is actually better for memory retention. Why? Because you focus on a moving object. And when you do that, you encode that information much better. Also, there's research to suggest that 90% of the memory that we retain has a visual element to it. So if you can associate something visual, I, I used to do, do this really strange thing that actually really helped was if I was typing something, I would just import a picture that I associated with whatever I was reading and I just let it sit in the document. And sure enough, my mind would just go back to that picture and there would be an association with everything that I read there. And so um, a, a lot of people believe that Howard Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences has been debunked in some way because of this research due to the fact that most people tend to visually encode what they read. Another important thing about reading, and I'll give you the theory, and then I say be creative in your application of it. There's something called BEM theory, B-E-M. It means beginning, end, and middle. And this also has to do with the encoding of things that we read or even just experience. We tend to remember first the beginning of anything, the end of something next, and then that which was in the middle tends to get lost. So you can prioritize your reading in, in these sorts of ways. Here's the way that I use it. First of all, you know that whatever you read first is probably what you're going to remember the most. And so if I end a reading session, I try to end it on an area where there was something exciting and I had a question about it too. That way I remember the question and the problem just kind of sticks with me. And so that when I go back to the reading, that's also the beginning part. So I kind of end on a part where there may be something a little exciting and I'm struggling a little bit. That's something that you can remember too. Uh, another thing that you can do too is take a three by five note card, keep it in the book. Some people just get overwhelmed by the sheer amount of text in a book, especially if that the print is fine. Just cover up the text and read as you go. And you know you're going to get distracted. People are looking at phones, things around them. That way, when your eyes come back to the page, you know exactly where you're at. I mean, just think of how much is lost in terms of attentional bandwidth by your eyes going off and on the page. At least if you have that note card there, you know you can come back to a spot where you were before. So there's a huge jumble of... I don't know, two and a half years of, of, of master's um, <laughs> learning that I had, do with it what you will. And it kind of connects to what some of the other guys were saying. Let's move on to the next question. This question is from Stone Age Jewel. They say, after reading much of Mark Fisher's work, it's frustrating to not have his voice right now. I would never ask for you to speak for the dead, but how has his writing on capitalist realism informed on the pandemic in the uh, events related to it. So one of the first pieces I put out on my um, my website was actually about this question, because on the out in the outset of the pandemic, at least in um, in Britain, there was some sort of rumours among sort of people quite in sort of the Mark Fisher sort of uh, work that capitalist realism was effectively made dead by the pandemic. In some, I mean, this was mainly based around the idea that of the government's furlough scheme, where they paid people, well, not everybody, most people were still forced to go to work, um, to stay at home with a certain set of their wages, which obviously wasn't enough. But the idea that the government could finally spend money after having defeated sort of the movement for spending, after having defeated Corbyn and uh, the, the Corbynist project just then, there was a sense in which, well, we, we won the argument. 
and that capitalist realism was over because fundamentally the state has uh, renounced its idea of uh, no longer being this minimalist neoliberal entity and is actually sort of taking on board what seemed at the first point to be uh, Labour's policies that they would they just been defeated on. And I sort of tried to make the point that we need to make a distinction between uh, capitalist realism as a whole and neoliberal realism. You can make the argument that maybe neoliberalism is, uh, is kind of dead as the official state capitalist ideology. But to declare that capitalist realism is over is actually capitalist realism functioning at a higher level, where you believed, you know, if you had a bit of Keynesianism, miraculously capitalist realism is gone. No, it's captured your imagination to the extent that you think that any deviation from neoliberalism is a deviation from capitalism itself. And I think it's something you need to, need to maintain. You know, the idea that capitalist realism can be broken from the idea that the government can send you $2,000 checks is, you know, is, which, which they're not going to because they're lying fuckers, um, is, 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 in, is inaccurate. And I think overall, the works of Mark Fisher, I think, especially if you think about his later work, and I think his later work is, I don't think we've actually fully understood the, the implications of what will develop from his later work. I even think there's going to be sort of an old, young Fisherian kind of a, kind of split. And I think, well, it's, it's already implicitly occurred. But enough on that. But the, idea, the politics of desire and how desire has played into uh, this pandemic, particularly around the ideas of uh, mental health being a political issue, particularly around ideas of being addicted to what we're desiring, you know, the whole libidinal economic issues of wanting to go back to the pub, wanting all these things that we that really were quite, you know, in ways at the source of our alienation. And there's this idea of going back to the roots of this function of desire and seeing how it functions in modern neoliberal sort of Western societies or post-neoliberal as we could call them now. I mean, like, no, I think this is important, right? Like, I, I think that, that, that this question is not exactly one that, that we, we should need to, to problematize at the level of like, uh, how, how has this person's work uh, affected the way in which we view this stuff? I, I, I don't think that uh, I don't think that capitalist realism is dead, uh, and I, I, I think it's all the more brought to life uh, by the fact that, at least in the United States, like these like market mechanisms don't change. Like, look at the kinds of debates that we're having in the House and Senate. Uh, about the stimulus package right now that that enough shows you that like um this idea that that a world that isn't one determined by like the management of particular market forces it just isn't isn't in the cards uh so i i think i think the question is absolutely uh a a crucial one when you think about who are the big winners during the pandemic i think about all of the global corporations that made out on the CARES Act, <laughs> I think about Jeff Bezos, who, you know, increased his wealth exponentially. Yeah. And meanwhile, we are left to scrounge for a, a measly $2,000. Yeah. That's a brilliant point. Like, it's not, it's not even that, like, it, it's so, it's so the opposite, right? What, what it is, is it's almost this, like, heart and Negri style ascension to, like, a new, a new formulation of empire. Right. It's it's a it's a it's a concretization of a of of a sort of collection of wealth that is now just solidifying. I know people talk like about the so and so, the wealth transfer. It was far more it, it, it was far more complicated and systematic than just this like uh, this immediate moment where like wealth was transitioned over to these like this. This was in the working for 20, 30 years. And the the catalyst for its. uh its acceleration was uh, the material conditions that confronted all of these countries uh, and all of these people uh, at the uh, the moment that uh, COVID struck. And meanwhile, people just cheer on Elon Musk and his yeah. space travel. He's going to take us to the moon, Craig. Don't you dare! A solar Atlas, Doge Coin. Yeah, I, I don't necessarily have any any particular thoughts on how Mark. Fisher's work relates to it beyond what's already been said. Other than I wanted to add that one, one of the points that Adam made is something I've been thinking about recently, and I, I, I think I posted about this um, probably yesterday, I think, on, on Twitter, which is the the kind of ambiguity around around the terms we, we use to describe capitalism, in particular the way in which 
um, the term neoliberalism has come to take on this particularly ambiguous character where because because the term itself can often be unclear sometimes, although of course it does have a quite specific and historical meaning, it becomes unclear sometimes whether what's being criticized is um, neoliberalism as a particular historical form that capitalism can take, or whether what's being criticized is capitalism as such. Um, and if, if the terms aren't clear, then sometimes what happens is that it's the former, it's neoliberalism, and very quickly the answer slides straight in, which is that normally sort of a return to um, Keynesian economics and a return to social democratic political um, consensus, the economic basis for which has been hollowed out in the you know most highly developed parts of the West for the last few decades, right? No necessary thoughts on on Mark Fisher. Maybe maybe you can make that uh, relate to, to Fisher. You know how we understand you know capitalist realism versus neoliberal realism. Other than I thought Adam raised a good point there that it's that uh, and to, to add to it that the way in which we I think the way in which we talk and describe capitalism and the kind of systems we take to exist makes a big difference in the kinds of political responses which we are able to articulate, and so that. Yeah, the, the the lapse between sort of what capitalist realism, which describes capitalism as such, and neoliberalism can be a, a slippery one, I think. I think if I could just like summarize uh, just a wider point, I think maybe the question of post capitalist desire, if you want to go along the Fisher lines, is um, well, really, what I know that all of us have left the, the pre COVID world because most of us are still in precarious labor and, you know, you know, quote unquote essential jobs that still get treated as like, like dog shit. But I think it's also a question for many people of, you know, what sort of world we want to return to? Those of us who can be said, in a sense, to be returning. You know, it, it, when a lot of people go outside you and what do we want changed? Do we, do we want to go back to the original thing or do we want to desire more than this? Because obviously what before wasn't working. A systemic understanding of the phenomenon that caused this should hopefully be a conscious raising exercise such that we can ask the question, what do we want to do to move forward from this? That's the question. Let's move on, shall we? So the next question comes from Lilac. They ask, if you were to assemble a Lacanian starter kit for new readers of Lacanian psychoanalysis, i.e. me, LOL, uh, which books would you add? These can include Lacan's writings, but also writings that guide in understanding Lacan as well as his critics. We talked about a few of these books beforehand. Who wants to start us out? I mean, I can start by just saying that I that uh, you know I I struggled with and still struggle with Lacan. Um, but that one text that I own and I, we were talking about it earlier is uh, Zizek's Looking Awry. Yeah, um, yeah. There's also another book on Hitchcock and Lacan. Uh, there and a Adam will talk about this. There is a little bit of a um, threshold for like film knowledge, but the thing is like. He, Zizek could can be a film snob, but he's also he's also got like broadly very popular tastes. So yeah. as long as you're aware of films like Pet Cemetery, things like that, um, I think Looking Awry is a fantastic way to understand like the central notions of like the mirror stage, the the symbolic, the the real, uh, the imaginary, and uh, he even has a great chapter on objet a in there, which yeah. I think is is. Really uh, something I still struggle with. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that would be my recommendation. Others will have better ones, I'm sure. But yeah. uh, I, I, I also struggle with Lacan. But I'll just just to add very quickly that aside from looking awry, um, his short book called How to Read Lacan is also really good. Um, there are all sorts of problems people have raised with Jesus' work in different ways. I still like him, but also I, I think um, as a um, interpreter of Lacan, it's almost. I mean, I can't think of anyone else off the top of my head who would be you know, the major figure other than Zizek on that one. So both of those books by Zizek I would recommend. Yeah. Bruce Fink as well has an in good introduction to Lacan. Um, oh, if, if you want to just get stuck into Lacan, his book, My Teaching, uh, is really good. It's a quite a short book with some introductory lectures he did to other psychoanalysts sort of explaining what the function of his work is. Um, Symbolic Imaginary in the Real, which I think could be in the I, I, I'm not too sure. That's not a bad one. Uh, the Pearl and Letter Seminar is not too bad, as long as you, like, you, you can skip most of the diagrams at the end. I'm sorry, Lacanians, um, you more or less can. Let's move on. The next question that we have is from Damien. It says, thoughts on contemporary Thomistic philosophers like Edward Fazer and Alistair McIntyre. And I think Matt has a, an, an answer for this one. 
Uh, yeah. Uh, so I, I gave this one a bit of thought, actually. I love the question because um, I have read works by both of these philosophers, but mainly McIntyre. Um, and I think there's all sorts of interesting ways in which um, McIntyre in particular, some of his concerns overlap directly with many of the concerns people involved in critical theory would have. So on Phaser, I would say that um, I don't really have much to say about him other than that his book on Aquinas is actually a really excellent introduction to Thomistic philosophy. Uh, beyond that, there's not much for me there, given he's a pretty overt conservative, um, you know, in sort of social and political sense. Um, but if you're looking for an introduction to Thomistic philosophy, his book on Aquinas is very good, um, particularly as he draws out the links with Aristotle, which is also, of course, super helpful if you want to then read McIntyre, right? Um, so my answer might be a little bit long, but I'll try and keep it concise. I've got some notes. Um, so McIntyre, I think, is a fascinating figure, particularly because he's, I don't know many like this, but he started off a Marxist and eventually... Um, over his life, you know, will convert to Catholicism and start writing about um, Aristotelian Thomistic philosophy, about virtue ethics, communitarianism in particular. Um, and so I wanted to say a few things about McIntyre and where there's some overlap, perhaps, with many of the concerns that the major thinkers in critical theory would also raise, like Adorno and Horkheimer in particular. Um, so... For McIntyre, modernity is essentially an almost unmitigated catastrophe. Um, and contemporary moral discourse in particular is essentially a confused mess of fragments from long gone civilizations and traditions, which have sort of survived in a piecemeal sense and then pieced together in a confused and often contradictory way. Um, so that, that's the problem with moral discourse in a certain sense, is that it, it, it does, it's not coherent. But more broadly, I think for McIntyre, there's, a, there's this, this kind of groundlessness to modernity. It lacks any kind of coherent foundation. But he also argues that through an examination of human history, we can see that that hasn't always been the case. That's his argument, at least. Um, he's partic he was particularly interested, of course, in the ancient Greeks and in medieval Christendom. Um, I would add there that he's not entirely uncritical about some of the problems there. I mean, if you want to look at like values of democracy in ancient Greece, he's not going to completely skip over the question of like you know slavery in, in Athens and so on, right? Um, but it is an issue sometimes in, in McIntyre's work, I think. So he thinks there have been times where there has been some sense of a co coherent moral worldview or broader metaphysical worldview, which we have lost. He thinks. And one of the interesting things about McIntyre, I think, is that he sense, he essentially sets us up with a choice. He thinks that today we are essentially forced to choose between Nietzsche and Aristotle, and he hopes that we're going to pick Aristotle, because he thinks that Enlightenment modern philosophy did not survive Nietzsche, put it that way. He, he really, he basically thinks Nietzsche is completely correct on this. He thinks, um, at least in terms of Kantian deontology, utilitarianism, etc., emotivism, in some cases, um, none of this really survives Nietzsche. But the, the problem is for him is that our, our contemporary moral theories don't survive because we've forgotten Aristotle, right? That That's his answer, is that because, that, because Nietzsche didn't necessarily take this seriously himself, it's one way out. He calls it, I think, sort of the best theory so far for trying to work through some of these difficult issues we, you know, we take to be there more flop more theory, right? About obligations and rights and virtue and practices and traditions and so on, um, individual society, etc. So McIntyre basically thinks that Nietzsche is basically correct. That not only is are these moral theories completely groundless and inco and a kind of incoherent mess in a, in a broader sense um, for us, he he thinks that there is a deep kind of metaphysical nihilism in 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 the sort of the modern world, and he worries about this quite quite seriously. And his basic answer is that in order to try and get out of this, it's sort of a problem that Nietzsche poses or analyzes. And Nietzsche has his own answer to this, right? This is one reading of Nietzsche, is that Nietzsche is a kind of, um, he provides a diagnosis of the, the nihilism already there in the modern world, right? And that he gives you an answer for how we might try and get out of this, which is the revaluation of all values, the creation of new values, etc. right? McIntyre doesn't like Nietzsche's answer, but he doesn't think the diagnosis is entirely wrong. 
what he proposes instead is essentially a return to the kind of moral theory advocated by Aristotle, which you find in Aquinas and so on, etc. But he, he mostly cashes this out in a kind of secular way, a sort of materialist way. He, he's not really interested in picking a fight with people who are atheists, etc. on this one. Um, and the basic idea then is that ethics is directly and intimately related to practices embedded within communities, right? Where the ends and the means kind of enter into each other, such that there's a measure of community uh, determined excellence in certain ways, which don't simply place uh, the ends you want at the very end of it. They always enter into it. So such that, you know, to, uh, to practice a certain thing just is to get better at it, right? Um, and he thinks mor- morality in the Aristotelian sense works this way as well. And there's a, a big role for tradition in this as well, um, which can be kind of difficult for McIntyre. Again, he's not entirely uncritical about this. I think he tries to place it in a quite explicitly critical way, where the thing about tradition for him is that it gives you a sort of a space for critique, right, for change, even abrupt change. Part of the problem with McIntyre is that there's, it, it's, it's essentially determined by a, a sense of nostalgia and alienation, I think, and that if, if, if we sort of follow someone like Marx or Adorno, um, the, the, the problems of enlightenment was that it, it never could live up to its own ideals, right? It was never going to be able to do that. Well, the, the same is the case for the sort of pre-enlightenment societies that McIntyre looks at, right? So as, as a sort of maybe one final note on this for anyone who's sort of potentially interested in McIntyre, because I think he does diagnose a, a quite serious problem in some ways, is that there's a really good book by um, Ross Poole, called Morality and Modernity. And Poole explicitly takes this question of the foundations of our ethical and community life um, and about the nature of reason as such. How do we think about reason, right? He takes all of this and then pieces it together with work from the Frankfurt School, from earlier philosophers and McIntyre and so on um, in, in a quite critical theoretical direction. And towards the end of the book he comes to the conclusion that there are at least two possible answers here and i think basically they consist in communism and feminism communism because it provides ways of tying individual identity to social identity in a new way um which kind of solves part of the problem there and he thinks i think he also thinks that feminism has a huge role to play in so far as it breaks down this public private distinction um and provides certain conditions of equality in public life, or could at least, right? And it also ties into a certain, what Poole calls a kind of maleness in dominant Western notions of reason, which isn't quite how Adorno and Horkheimer put it, but it's about, it seems like basically the same thing to me. Adorno and Horkheimer also say that there's something about the Western conception of reason itself after the Enlightenment that tends towards domination. It inherently t- tends towards dominating and mastering the things which reason comes into contact with. So I would say it's a great question and I hope I've given some sort of response about what McIntyre has to say there, why it might be interesting to read about. McIntyre's central book on this is After Virtue, which is a not very long and also not particularly challenging book either. Uh, Ross Poole's book is called Morality and Modernity. I don't know if there's a particularly recent pressing of it. If the question about how do we think about reason as such, if that question doesn't quite makes sense to you like if there's this if you're not quite sure what the question is asking there um it, it would be also great to just go back to kind of the origins of that which is max horkheimer's book eclipse of reason which is also extremely short and very readable where he he puts into question the the instrumental uses we make of reason in modernity let's move on the next question is just three words it's from raymond favorite analytic philosophers maybe we'll start with will go ahead will jl austin what <laughs> yeah me too you know, like uh I, I you can't do this stuff without austin um you know uh especially that that final essay on performative utterances uh you know you you don't anyone who's writing on foucault butler gender uh even even to, to he, austin's even helpful with with althusser and the ideological state apparatus. Like, I, I know that there's this trend to want to sort of suppress and uh, the the almost the overly I'm going to say like hyper structured desire to like uh, completely systematize philosophy. I get it, um, but some of these folks, 
at the linguistic turn and the analytic turn more broadly, some of their work is is really it's got like a, a, a lot of modalities and multifaceted in their nature that you can actually utilize them in a way that that's really important. And Butler uh, does that. It, it's central to to Butler's work. So yeah, I'll, I'll I'll go with Austin for for that reason. Okay, cool, Adam. I think I was I was originally trained as an analytic philosopher, but I I sort of fell out of that discipline on on methodological grounds. So I. God, I don't really read much of it anymore, but I think at least at the time I was doing it, the stuff I most enjoyed, yeah, was was also some of the, sort of the great system builders who fundamentally I I disagree with, but just the intellectual creativity and and the artifice that they put into their uh, intellectual uh, edifices is just you know always always a joy to read. So particularly um, uh, David Kellogg Lewis on the plurality of worlds, modal realism, absolutely. Uh, out there stuff, but just so beautifully argued for them, so beautifully crafted. Even if it is a most part a sort of a, a very pragmatic, uh, presuppositional mode of thinking, similar to uh, Saul Kripke. You know, naming and necessity is is a very fun read of all its modal arguments and stipulations and the the the, the Humphrey argument stuff. Like that. I used to enjoy reading that. It's hard. To, I don't really like calling up philosophers analytic philosophers because I think it's something. It becomes quite reductive. I always try to see it as sort of like the ones who sort of double down on being analytic versus the particular sort of anti-Hegelian school of uh, of, of post-war Britain. G. E. Moore is also a really good analytic philosopher because you can read his argument about the external world and hands, and then you can uh, sort of dismiss most of the work of that school as a bunch of uh, common, so-called common sense. Uh, <laughs> Intellectual yeah. imperialism from a bunch of uh, British aristos who um, <laughs> really just didn't want to do the reading and unionized against this demand to do the reading. Mm. <laughs> I would say I have to go with, or I have to agree with Adam and Will. I think um, if you want to get into analytic philosophy, how to do things with words, JL Austin, I mean, if you're listening to this episode because you like Deleuze, that book is a crucial book in understanding, for example, the postulates of linguistics and A Thousand Plateaus. Um, also, Adam said, uh, David Lewis, <laughs> like I said, um, I agree with uh, Mark Balliger, who was one of my teachers, um, in saying that he is one of the most interesting and creative philosophers who is identified with the tradition of analytic philosophy. I think also if you want to delve deeper into analytic philosophy, look at Quine, Two Dogmas of Empiricism. That's that's a good one. Also, just uh, the analytic philosophers who are dealing with quantum mechanics. For example, Evredi and quantum mechanics, multiple worlds theory. I, I mean, all, all of that stuff is just really thought-provoking and interesting. Uh, what about you, Matt? Uh, my 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 answer is actually fairly easy. It, it's definitely Bernard Williams. Um, I, I, I love almost all of what I've I, I've read by him. I, I think he's a really, really interesting and almost quite quite unique figure in British analytic philosophy. Um, if you've not come across his work, the best way I can put it to you is that um, he's the Nietzschean in the analytic school critiquing the others a lot of the time. Um, he, he was sort of associated with a movement to, you know, in, in its early stages, but became quite strongly skeptical of where it was going, particularly with the philosophy of language um, and the particularly reductive um, sort of positivist accounts in the early days. Um, and he's best when he, but he's, I think he's best when he's writing on ethics, um, because although he will he will rarely mention Nietzsche by name, and there's probably um, historical and political reasons for why that was the case in sort of post-war Britain, of course. Um, but it, it's very clear that his his perspective on um, ethics or morality, and he does he does distinguish between the two, is deeply informed by a reading of Nietzsche, where his basic thesis is that um, we have this he calls it a strange institution called morality, which has all these various quirks and problems which he described at length um and critiques and then offers us a sort of interesting alternative i mean it, it might actually fit in give my last answer if you were sort of pursuing that line of thinking about you know moral foundations and so on um bernard williams would be useful there as well i think so it, that's that's definitely my my firm answer there yeah just add also the bernie williams thing i mean his book morality is absolutely uh, amazing yeah. it's, it's a sort of book that if you was ever sort of questioning to do sort of very sort of a blunt kind of nihilism about owing anything to anyone else or acting for anyone else or anyone else's interest, 
it, it's just one of the most straight talking books about uh, tackling that sort of very sort of uh, arguably kind of immature kind of um, sort of straw nihilist kind of impulse. Yeah. And it's it's one of the, especially critique of utilitarianism as well. It's incredibly powerful, yeah. uh, straight talking book and. Uh, much like as he says here, unlike most unsatisfying uh, ethics, it's not particularly boring either. <laughs> yeah. And I think we should wrap up this section. Will and I agreed to talk about this, which was um, one of our favorite analytic philosophers is actually Deleuze. And the reason we say that, I mean, first of all, I don't like deploying this this hard distinction, like Adam said, between continental and analytic philosophy. In the end, I just see it all as philosophy. Of course, there's camps. Of course, there are tendencies. But um, it's important to remember, too, that Deleuze, in his time, tended to privilege Anglo and American philosophers in his reading at a time where there was a certain tradition of philosophy popular in France. He he avoided that tradition in order to read, uh, uh, well, I, I wouldn't say completely avoided it, but tended to privilege, as I said, American Engli and English philosophers. Hence, you see, you know, Deleuze's book, uh, Logic of Sense. It's on, it's on Frege, who's typically identified with the analytic tradition. We're looking at the J.L. Austin stuff in A Thousand Plateaus. And these, you know, you can see little traces of these ideas all over Deleuze's work. So my favorite analytic philosopher is Deleuze. So there you go. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure that will be completely uncontroversial. Good. <laughs> Bring it on. Challenge the audience. I like it. Oh, here's one for all of us. This question is from an increasingly incoherent boundary between two accounts. The question is, what fiction are the Asset Horizon team reading lately, and do your theory interests inform your fiction choices? I'll start with this one, I guess. Uh, I haven't been reading much fiction lately, to be honest. However, I do read uh, a fair amount of poetry, and there is a poet that I I'd love to get her on the show. She's alive today. Uh, Ray Armand Trout. And her... She comes from the language tradition of poets, and a, a lot of the themes of her poetry involve the sort of collision between science and, I, I would say in some sense, capitalist realism. There, there's a lot of an infusion of scientific language, quantum physics, collided together with the sort of you know, stumblings we have in our daily affairs, in our relationships, and so forth, and in really interesting ways. And there's a way in which we could talk about that poetry as being an intensive form of poetry, as was the language poet's tradition. And I'm thinking of like Charles Bernstein, for example. Um, Ron Silliman is another poet who, who I would put into that tradition. And I mean, it's not fiction. However, it is a kind of literature that, that I read kind of in close conversation with my philosophical reading. So like uh, the, the, the question of like fiction, um, you know, when you work, work i don't do work when you when you operate in existential philosophy uh a lot of the more fundamental texts in that tradition are actually fiction uh the plague the stranger uh dostoevsky's notes from underground um the brothers karamazov or at least a couple chapters touch on touch on the existential reaction to to religion what uh fiction am i am i dealing with i'm actually doing a just a quick rereading of of notes from underground because there's a section about um uh the the moaning of of i the the, the uh, underground man has has a toothache and there's this long passage where he talks about the cathartic nature of this moan, refusing to get the tooth examined, but just moaning. Uh, and I'm, I'm doing something with that. It's not very good, but, but that's, what, that's what I'm dealing with right now. So yeah, I'm, I'm reading some Dostoevsky, I guess. I'm kind of going through a few different texts at the moment. There's some I plan to read. I, I quite like, um, at least I'm kind of into like, uh, well, generally I'm into like the interactions between um, sort of the occult and religion as well as uh, political critiques, uh, building on what Matt said about McIntyre. I've been reading a really good book recently called A Canticle for Leibowitz. It's like an old sci-fi classic about, yeah, the free ages of the church. <laughs> it's so good. It's got a critical political interaction of the uh, 
Catholic Church, which is wide society, but society is a post nuclear, gradually building kind of society. Another book I've been trying to get into is um, a Q by Luther Blissett, uh, which is about sort of um, a similar kind of thing about a spy going through the uh, chasing various revolutionaries across Europe during the Peasants' Wars. We have uh, people like Thomas Munzer show up, the uh, the proto sort of communist uh, revolutionary preacher. Uh, what else? A lot of Grant Morrison. Um, Alan Moore kind of stuff. It's very sort of anti Oedipus in terms of its uh, interaction with a uh, sort of chaos magic or for Alan Moore, like traditional ceremonial guys, like, you know, your uncle Al Crowley's and stuff like that. Poetry t- tends to be more German, I guess, because I'm trying, I've got these dual language editions of Hölderlin and Goethe, which I'm sort of trying to do to sort of get uh, my, my, my German reading chops up. But my, one of my favorite poets is probably, it's probably Hafez, uh, the, the Persian poet from Shiraz. He has he always has these amazing sort of ruminations and verses on on, on love, but also on intoxication and ecstasy, on wine wine and religion. It's 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 some really beautiful stuff. Can I plug uh can I plug some poetry real quick? Go uh, for it. On Adam's happy oh, hour at off. Hipples. Yeah. Uh there was <laughs> a, I think uh I'll I'll share it again. But the the Adam's Adam's work, uh poetic work is definitely worth checking out. Uh the poetry I'm reading is just a gambin. So <laughs> no, <I'm> kidding. <laughs> um actually, since we're talking about anti edipal writings and since we're talking about poetry, there are two poets that I've kind of grown up with, you know, maybe since late high school up until now, um, are Russell Edson and James Tate. And I love the the sort of um, anti edipal slash paranoiac themes of those poems. I highly recommend uh, a book by Russell Edson called The Tunnel by James Tate. There's there's a lot that you could take a look at. Uh, Memoirs of the Hawk, The Ghost Soldiers is another great one. And of course, there's the there's anthologies out now since James Tate passed away and Rus- Russell Edson passed away as well too. But good stuff. What about you, Matt? Yeah, I, honestly, I I haven't read any. Uh, sort of uh, fiction this year yet, unfortunately. Um, it's been already a pretty hectic two months or so for me, and I've been trying to keep up with the sort of theory stuff that I sort of have to read. Um, that said, last year I read um, a few a few books by uh, Ivan Turgenev, um, particularly First Love and Fathers and Sons. Uh, Fathers and Sons was amazing. Um, uh, what else did I read? Master Margarita by Mikhail Bulgakov. Uh, I think I read Sid Arthur as well. Um, Ooh, nice. Great. And, uh, oh, um, The Map and the Territory by Michelle Welbeck, uh, which I absolutely loved. Absolutely loved that book. And I think I think maybe some of my interests in theory do inform what I read in terms of fiction. Um, just, I, I, I like when... Um, Firstly, I like when a piece of fiction makes me not just sort of feel a certain way, but think in a certain way, right? Um, it gives me something to mull over, which I can take with me after the, you know, turn the last page. Um, but also, I, I think that um, fiction can convey ideas and notions that uh, sort of academic prose really cannot ever do. Um, and so there's also a kind of broader value to reading it as well um i don't want to sort of you know instrumentalize fiction into being this thing like which you can read to like you know um acquire theory points or something um that isn't it but um yeah i, I think it probably is a relation between the two things so I, I yeah i like books that make me think as well um uh, and, and sort of something i can take with me um i remember reading uh <clears throat> the memory police uh by yoko ogawa uh towards the end of last year that one really was uh Firstly, extremely moving, but also really thoughtful and thought-provoking as well um, about the nature of personal identity, about grief and loss and memory. <laughs> really great book. Um, I need to read more fiction, honestly. Uh, I, just, I, I do too. I, I find it really hard I to justify too. it sometimes. When I, I, there's this book of theory I, I'm meant to read and I've got good reason to. Like, uh, I'm going to read. I might as well read what I'm meant to, you know? <laughs> also, like, fun fact about Turgenev. Uh, he was uh, in the same Hegel class as... Uh, Kierkegaard, Bakunin, Engels, and Sterner. So, wow, pretty pretty big on his Hegelian nihilism. I go, wow, okay. he got around. Well, that in retrospect, that makes a lot of fathers and sons make sense. 
Because the class wasn't taught by Hegel, it was taught by a guy called Karl Werder, who was specifically known for emphasizing the use of nothing as a central a central point of Hegel's thought. Right. Okay. So it made it brought an entire generation of Hegelians into nihilism. <laughs> Based. Shall we move on? Here's a question. I'll try to knock this one out quick. I don't know if anybody else has anything for it, but the question is from Dean. It says, what similarities do you find between Carl Jung and Felix Gattari? And I'll say this first. For every similarity, there's probably four differences. <laughs> but that said, I think the treatment of Lacan and Freud by Deleuze and Gattari is applicable to Jung uh, in, in many respects. And there's So, for example, in Anti-Oedipus, there is a whole section, I think it's in the third chapter, where they talk about returning to myth. And um, it seems that Gattari's influence is pretty heavy at that part of the book, where he lambasts the notion of returning to myth as a way to schizoanalyze. And I mean, clearly, Carl Jung and, and Freud, to uh, a large extent, too, depend upon myth in the formulation of their theories. And so the question then is, okay, if uh, Gattari's not doing myth, what is he doing? I selected actually this very small portion from uh, the Soft Subversions collections of essays 77 to 85 that sort of highlights the distinction between Gattari and Carl Jung. And it's, it's very short, so I'll just read it. He says, it is possible to use a model in which the unconscious is open to the future and able to integrate any heterogeneous semiotic components that may interfere. So just to think aloud on that point, here's a point of comparison and departure between Gattari and Jung. Jung is going to look at the contents of the unconscious as he sees them as all in play in terms of our ability to work with them in terms of dream analysis or active imagination and so forth. However, for Gattari, these things are not necessarily going to be reducible to archetypes in, in any sense, as, as we may see as we read on a little bit says here, then, meaningful distortions no longer arise from an interpretation of underlying contents. Okay, think archetypes there. Instead, they become part of a machinic setup entirely on the text surface. And here we see this privileging of surface and the surface depth distinction. And one of the ways I read Gattari here is, like, we're not thinking about depth at all. Everything's a surface effect. Rather than be mutilated by symbolic castration... Freud, Lacan, and maybe to a lesser extent Jung, recurring incomplete goals act instead as autonomous purveyors of subjectivation. The rupture, the breach of meaning is nothing else than the manifestation of subjectivation in its earliest stage. It is the necessary and adequate fractalization which enables something to appear where the access before was blocked. It is the deterritorializing opening. And one of the interesting things that Gattari says, I don't think it's in this essay, it's elsewhere, where he says, why not use something like Kafka as a way to interpret dreams, or use the images that we find in any piece of literature as a kind of matrix into which we can input other semiotic content, whether it's in the form of daydreams, fantasies, dreams, and so forth, and kind of plug them in. Like, this is what Gattari is trying to do is like, let's take all the things that we see around us, art, television shows, and, and what have you, and plug our own semiotics into them and see what we can create. What sort of enlivening escape or line of flight can we develop? Not simply those um, subordinated to uh, transcendent figures, whether it's in the form of the great mother archetype or the witch, which Jungian theorists and analysts see as being the sort of primary substrate for interpreting unconscious activity. It, it seems that, that Gattari wants to be more creative and, and more open in his approach to dealing with unconscious content in that aspect. But I'll finish with one similarity. The one thing that, and I don't think, he might mention Jung specifically, and I can't remember exactly where it is, but Gattari found a lot of value in things like free association and in dream analysis, which is evident in the collection of essays that I'm reading from. The next question is from Guillermo. Do you have any good recommendations for reading on either Deleuze and Derrida or Deleuze and Levinas? Either attempts at synthesizing or contrasting. I read Deleuze and Derrida, Difference in the Power of the Negative, but considered it was trying too hard to systematize both thinkers. So, Will, do you have something on that? Yeah, so like I, I get that... Uh, that um, it's a difficult, it's a difficult text uh, 
Vernon's. I, I, I admit that I have it, but I admit that I haven't <laughs> worked through it. Um, systematizing Deleuze is something that can be super helpful. In fact, like as we've talked about before, Deleuze is often rather systematic, um, especially in difference and repetition. Um, and schematize, I guess schematizing would be a better word. Um, but for understanding Deleuze and Derrida and the power of the negative, I, I guess, frankly, it would be to first deal with Deleuze on, on his notion of, of difference by, like, by itself and then start to establish kind of an understanding of uh, the considerations that uh, Derrida has regarding, regarding Hegel. Right, because Derrida is going to have a very different engagement with Hegel halfway through his career, and then maybe return to to uh, to to difference in the power of the negative, because I do think that there's um, there's maybe some some legwork that, if done prior to your engagement with it, could could be helpful. But again, like I've not worked through the text, and my Hegel's like, as Adam knows, you know, embarrassingly shaky. So yeah. <laughs> Um, my, my only thought there is that, um, so Derrida is not someone I know particularly well as a thinker and neither is a person I'm about to suggest. Um, and if I'm like embarrassingly wrong, obviously like Craig will cut this out, but my understanding is that part of Larry Wells project is that he's supposed to be trying to, um, draw on elements of both of these thinkers, both Derrida and Deleuze, um, but in a completely new way, um, I could be wrong there, but it may be worth looking into Larawell um, and his relationship between the two. Um, and secondly, I suspect when it comes to Derrida and Levinas, there probably isn't much room for any kind of common ground there. Um, you can't always join up philosophers in a way you'd like, unfortunately. And I, I, I think with those two, it's just going to be a kind of they just disagree sort of sort of situation. I think a good overview for. Um... A lot of the intellectual leaps and uh, Derrida's interlocutors throughout his life. I think one of the greatest summaries I've, I've read of it is um, uh, Peter Salmon's latest biography of Derrida, mm. an event perhaps out, out on Verso. That's mm. got some incredibly well written ways of explaining his methodology, but also his uh, various intellectual turns for the engagement with, with Levinas, uh, quite a lot on his engagement with Searle as well. I think it's over a really good. Yeah, good summary of, of, of Matt's life and work. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. The next question is going to be a, an amalgamation of three different questions. That one comes from Ryan, another one comes from Aaron, and the other one comes from Muntasir. And excuse me if I botch the pronunciation. The, uh, I'm going to make it the super question. The question goes like this. What are some good ways to get started in theory? Like what are what to you are some foundational texts? Um Another thing to ask is, how do you structure your self-study? Let's say you're not in university, for example. What are some ways that you would get started? Theory recommendations, philosophy 101. Like if you're just starting out, maybe studying by yourself, maybe you're even getting on the path to going to grad school or something like that. Where would you begin? And how would you begin? What are some sort of maxims that you would adopt in, in this process of getting on board with philosophy? Oh, this is such a hard question because, you know, if given that we've, you know, most tend to come up through the for university and through that sort of education system. There's a sense in which giving people a sort of a lot of starting coordinates poses a kind of danger in reproducing uh, you know the canon of, of Western philosophy, so to speak, and also its its implicit uh, biases and um, and structural uh, exclusions. Yeah, I think it is difficult because um, especially if it's self-study, I think it's massively important that what you're reading really, really interests you, right? But it's something you can get invested in and draw some sort of value out of. Um, on the other hand, um, I, I think in, in many cases, it's, it's a mistake to start with, to start with philosophers like Deleuze, for example, or Nietzsche. Um, I, 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 my general advice on this is to read Plato, um, particularly the Republic. And one of, one of the reasons why I suggest that is firstly, it's completely correct that most, most, at least most of the history of Western philosophy is essentially responding to Plato in one way or another, right? Um, so you, it would be really helpful to have some understanding at least of the general contours of Plato's thought. The other is that because 
um, The Republic is a quite general book. It covers uh, metaphysics, ethics, political philosophy, and other sort of topics. And the result is that by reading through it, you can figure out exactly well what, what, exactly what it is that interests you, right? Am I less interested in metaphysics and more interested in sort of the relationship between ethics and politics, right? Um, and from there, you can sort of go a little bit further on from that. You maybe read a bit more Plato or just move on to something else entirely. But I think having some understanding of just for really broad strokes of the um, the big figures, I guess, at least in the history of Western philosophy can be really helpful. Um, otherwise, a lot of the context of later thinkers, their debates and their ideas gets missed out. I mean, Nietzsche's a really dangerous one for that one, I think, in particular. If, if Nietzsche should, should almost never be the first philosopher you read. Um, he, he is overtly and openly, you know, critiquing the entire history of Western philosophy. So... Mm -hmm. it, you know, it's very easy to reduce it down to sort of simple terms if you're kind of getting that history just from him and sort of almost parodying it sometimes. So that's my advice. Sorry to, to go back there. My general advice yeah, is do, do not start with Nietzsche. No, don't start with Nietzsche. Do not start with Nietzsche. <laughs> you'll yeah. become fucking insufferable. You will. You will. You'll absolutely um, become <laughs> the worst, the absolute worst. Um, read some Plato. Also, um, there's a really good book um by raymond goyce called changing the subject uh, philosophy from socrates to adorno um that's a good one because it's a broad overview of a whole range of different philosophers sort of in chronological order but he only talks about the ones that interest him which is quite quirky but also it talks about big sort of canon thinkers but also slightly more niche theory thinkers like uh lukacs nietzsche and adorno and so on um so that might also be a good overview yeah, if I could speed up my recommendations just quickly. Um, Frederick Copleston's History of Philosophy covers everything. It's quite hard to get. If you, if you can get a PDF, it'd be great. He covers everything. He's just got volumes. So you go from like, you know, from Fichte to Schopenhauer kind of stuff. It covers everything. It's an incredibly well done study. Um, another thing is yep. not everyone's got the time to do stuff. You know, not all studying is reading. Yep. Not everyone's got the time to do stuff. Not everyone's got the time or capacity to do uh, you know, like long sit downs, monastic sort of. Um, Peeings are various texts. So, you know, it's like, why are we here? You know, podcasts, YouTube videos, audio books, um, you know, even like, e e even to even some TV shows. I mean, you know, old clips of like the Brian McGee interviews yeah, on definitely. YouTube. Uh, if, you know, if I was going to get, if, if you wanted to direct, if you wanted to do like a, a self Rick Rick, yeah. yeah, a self study kind of program. For example, if I, if I was going to do a self study thing on Hegel, you, you, once a week, you could you could read a paragraph of the phenomenology of spirit, watch Greg Sadler's video, Professor Gregory Sadler, uh, his one on that paragraph. That once a week, you would you would eventually um, attain. I think start line. to get to grips of what Hegel is. Yeah, uh, there is an absolute goldmine of new content out there. I hate the word content, um, of which we we already a, a tiny a tiny part. And I think you can definitely structure your media consumption in a way that you can sort of gradually get this in for osmosis. I mean, for example, I mean, a lot of the Deleuze and Guattari stuff, I'm not saying I've got a great interpretation of Deleuze and Guattari, but a lot of the stuff I get has also just been having conversations on Twitter, occasionally watching a YouTube video, doing some, uh, listening to some podcasts. I get most of this from talking with these guys for osmosis mm -hmm. because I, I don't have time to read all the thousand fucking plateaus, you know. Um, <laughs> this Discords, Discord channels for reading groups. You can just sit in and... This is where it all came out of. There is so many more ways to do it now. So if you can't, if you have the time to sit down and do yeah. the whole monastic reading thing, it, it, it is possible. Yeah, I'm going to focus on the theory side of the, that question rather than the, the rigid philosophical side. I do believe and agree that Plato is the place to start. Like I'm still laboring over interpretations of book three of the Republic. Right. It, you know, I, I get older and I, you know, it's still central to, to my work, uh, work, <laughs> shit. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, the one place where I would start actually for theory is, is, a, a, a letter that Karl Marx wrote. Um, I, I believe it's in the Marx and Engels reader. I think it's probably one of the first texts in there. Uh, it's a ruthless critique of everything, uh, existing. I actually do think that that four page paper does more to help you understand the trajectory of critical theory than a lot of the sort of essays that uh, some professors will will 
at least in my experience, have you start out with. So I actually think that that, that, that piece by, by Karl Marx is, is a great one. Um, because again, like I, I'm going to take the theory side here because I know that not everybody's going to engage with theory out, out of a love of philosophy. Sometimes it's an interdisciplinary interest. Yeah. And I think that that's where theory actually starts to show its, its teeth and its ability to, to sort of break through is when, you know, you have media students reading Adorno or well, I guess that's not the great example or like Marcuse or so on. Um, or I don't know, healthcare professionals reading Foucault. You know, the, the, there's there's this uh, this uh, multidisciplinary trend in in academia, and of course, there's like a risk, right? Because like uh, prison guards reading Foucault or doctors reading Foucault, and then sort of it becoming neutralized and losing its um, its radical potential is something that you know bothers me deeply. But you know, interdisciplinary discussions about theory, I think, have always been helpful, particularly when it comes to media theory, uh, queer theory. Uh, gender studies, things like that, um, where I don't want to tell students that like, no, you actually have to like study for 60 years to be able to understand like birth of tragedy. Like you can do it, but there is going to be some like heavy lifting, right? You know, if you don't read the plays that Nietzsche is discussing in birth of tragedy, or if you don't have at least like a working understanding of Schopenhauer, it will be harder. It will be harder. Um, it's, it's not that it can't be done, but it, but it will be hard. And that'll be my admonition. I won't say you can't do it. I'm never going to tell anyone they can't read something. But, um, but do expect you know, intense difficulty if your first text is going to be on the genealogy of morality. Uh, that's going to be a heavy lift. You know, because when he mentions the lightning flashing and then makes a, you know, a quick comment about the Kantian subject, that's a really, really, really important argument that I think is what? Two sentences? You yeah. know, so it, it, it will be really, really difficult to to grasp the entirety of the thing. So I will so I will agree with Matt and Adam, but I will say that you can do it. It's just going to take a lot of work to start in those places yeah. and maybe more work than you'd be willing to do. So, you know, just work your way through. Don't rush to these people. You don't have to have a take on, you know, Leotard or La Ruelle. Yeah. Just let them do their thing and take your time. Yeah. My advice is everything everybody just said, maybe just a few additions to it and maybe some strategies. The one thing I would add is figure out where your philosophical daimon wants to go. That's you getting a sense of problems that you think are important or the problems that keep you awake at night, right? I have a friend uh, that I used to commute with to to work. He also, he, he's an MA student in philosophy and we just, we used to have an hour long drive and we would just talk philosophy. And he talked about how him getting involved with philosophy was figuring out the whole free will versus determinism debate, like yeah. actually waking him up in the middle of the night and being like, how the hell do you solve this problem? You know, for some people, it's that. For some people, it's metaphysics, right? For some people, it's capitalism versus communism. Yeah. And then you just explore literature around that problem. The other thing that I would say in conjunction with that is, okay, that's your problem, right? But now there's all this peripheral stuff. You've got Plato over here, a name that just comes up. You've got Nietzsche over here that comes up, Laruel, Deleuze. Maybe grab a Goodwill store copy of Plato's dialogues if you can find it. And just every now and again, you know, read the apology. Just get that done. Crito, super short. Now you got that under your belt too. Also, if you pop into the Goodwill store, invariably you're going to find some critical thinking book or maybe even uh, like an old philosophy textbook like Questions That Matter. I know that's a popular one. Grab that. It's going to be a buck ninety nine. Keep it in your car. Then on your lunch break, you just crack that thing open and there's a little sidebar about the deontological argument, right? That's what you read on your lunch. And it's like, boom, now you got that, right? Yeah. So you have your problem. You have your book. Like maybe you're an anti-Oedipus, like because you're part of that reading group. Here's the problem that you're thinking about. This is what you're doing on your lunch break. And it becomes this sort of like nomadic circuit that you're running, right? You're going back to the text that you're, you're, you're working on. You're going into that textbook. You're doing the YouTube videos like Matt was saying. And at some level, all of us here on the podcast and everybody on Twitter that we interact with, that's what we're doing, right? But, we'll you know, sometimes it means just, yeah, we're doing it on some level, but sometimes it just means being a little bit more intentional about something. Like, like I said, I'm going to buy this book and I'm going to keep that in my car. I know I got my lunch break. I don't got a lot of time to read, but 
while I snack on this egg McMuffin, I'm going to do the critique of puries. Nice. <laughs> right? yeah. You know, yeah. something like that. So you develop little rituals around that. I think one thing, because I made this joke on Twitter, of course, where else would I do it? I made a joke on Twitter and it was uh, that I have three copies of Discipline and Punish. Um, two of them are paperbacks and they're filled with two different kinds of notes. Uh, because they're two different readings. But one of the readings, I was literally just looking for what I can say about uh, disability in philosophy. And I have to tell you, going in with that sort of literary uh, uh, you know, attunement really changes the way you approach it. So I think Craig's point about like, know what you're looking for, know why you're doing what you're doing sometimes is such a good uh, suggestion. Because it's going to give it's going to give you stakes. It's going to give you a reason to care about the book you're reading. And there's nothing worse than reading a book you do not care about. Thank you for once again caring about this podcast and making it to the end. We really appreciate your support. Find us on Patreon. Contribute for as little as $1 just to get into the mix. At the $5 and $10 level, there are other benefits. So check it out. Otherwise, find us on Twitter, Instagram, you know all the places. Check out my meme game. We'll talk it up pretty nicely, so see what I'm cooking up these days. All right, peace out.